Hallelujah. Mark, the 10th chapter, we're going to start at verse number 46. If you have that this morning, stand on your feet if you don't mind. And we're going to read this together. Mark's gospel, chapter number 10, reading from the New King James Version. Here's what it says. It says, Now they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, for he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. And so Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Then the blind man said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, that I might receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus on the road. Father, we thank you for the mighty power of the Holy Spirit today. Lord, we know that when you ascended after the, after the uh, resurrection and you sit, sat down at the right hand of the Father, you sent the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, you sent him down upon the church in Acts chapter 2 and you never revoked it. You said, lo, I'll be with you even unto the end of the age. So that means this morning that as we've prayed, as we've gave, as we've gave, as we've worshiped, as we've praised, Lord, the presence of the Holy Spirit is here. And Lord, I know that if you're here, that you're able to do anything your people need to, to be, have done in their lives. So we thank you that you are God and there's nothing too impossible for you. And so this morning, speak to us and demonstrate your power and your mercy towards us today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You can be seated this morning. Turn and smile at somebody real big and say good morning to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'm so glad to be able to be here this morning with each and every single one of you. Uh, as I mentioned, last week we had an amazing missionary. Was Jerry Schultz not great? Amen. And the response of the people that showed up that said, we've been called into ministry and, and into missions specifically, that is an amazing thing. You may not know this. You may be a newcomer to our church, but there are people here that will tell you this church has history of people going out from ministry from this place missionaries and pastors and youth pastors, and, and that's great. That's our vision. That's our calling. That's actually part of the New Testament mandate. We tend to judge a church on how many people are coming, but God also looks at how many are going. Amen. And so that's equally as important. But we're excited about that and what happened. But this week, we're going to go in a whole different direction. And this morning, I want to start this series, as I said, entitled Divine Interruptions. Somebody say that with me. Divine Interruptions. What is a divine interruption? A divine interruption is when our carnality or our humanity have an intersection with deity. I believe that as we look through Scripture, the life of Christ, the life of the apostles, as we've been studying the book of Acts on Wednesday nights, what we see is that the Holy Spirit, time and time again, is bursting into the scene, changing things, and causing God to get the glory in people's lives. And so this morning, from the life of a man that Scripture calls blind Bartimaeus, I want to talk to you from the subject, the making of a miracle. The making of a miracle. What is a miracle? A, a miracle is something that really cannot be explained logically. It transcends the laws of nature. The laws of nature, we have Newton's law, the laws of gravity, we've got the law of lift. There are several things that we have in the world that are laws that God placed in, uh, in, in their order whenever he created the foundations of the earth. Um, but a miracle is something that by definition transcends the law of nature. In other words, a miracle is something that happens that the only logical explanation explanation for it is God. Oh, come on this morning. Y'all got to help me a little better than this. I said a miracle is, the, is something that when it happens, when it shifts, when it transpires, the only logical explanation is God. 
Now, the question that I have for those of you in this room this morning is this. Is there anybody in this room that needs a miracle? Okay, I'm going to preach to this side because these people need a miracle. Uh, What I asked is, is there anybody that needs a miracle? I'm telling you, we live in a day and an hour that where we are living right now, the world needs to see in demonstration the, the Jesus that we preach about breaking into circumstances and situations so that he can get the glory out of people's lives. We need miracles. I don't know if you saw the news last week, but there was a man in South Africa. He was uh, the most notoriable uh, the, the, the Satanist in South Africa. He was the head of the Satanic Church in South Africa, tattoos all over his face, 666, pentagram, all of that stuff. He was a, a devout God hater. He got on a, a, a podcast and are uh, doing an interview, some type of live interview, spewing hate about the gospel and about Jesus and questioning his validity and all of those things. And after that interview, somebody that was in the audience, a lady, she went and hugged him and told him that he, he was loved that she cared about him, that she loved him. The very love of Jesus hugged this man through this woman. And now he's saying, I renounce my old ways. He resigned from his position in the church of Satan. And now he's a follower of Christ. All of his doctrine's not right. He's still a new believer. He needs to be discipled. But my friend, that is a miracle. It is a divine interruption into the evil, wicked plans of this world. And God breaks in and brings a breakthrough. There was a satanic altar, I don't know if you saw it on the news, that had been erected and fashioned that fell spontaneously this last week. I'm telling you, some amazing things are happening in the world. If we just had eyes to see and ears to hear that church, we literally could be at our finest moment. I believe Jesus is coming. I believe that the rapture of the church is imminent, that a trumpet is about to blast, but I don't believe that it's just going to be all gloom and doom. I believe that before Jesus comes, there will also be power and boom. Why? Because the Bible says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So that leaves me this morning to have hope for a move of God. It gives me hope for a generation to come. And I'm just believing that in these moments and hours that we're living, that God through his glorious power would shine his face on us once again. I'm telling you, by our own history, we are people that believe in miracles. I don't know if you've ever seen a miracle. I don't know if you've ever witnessed a miracle. But my friend, I have seen miracles verifiable miracles, not just overseas, but even here in the United States. There was a pastor's wife in Mobile, Alabama. Her name was Delia Knox. This whole testimony is completely documented on the internet. She was paralyzed for over two decades, 20 plus years, where a drunk driver had hit her and she was not able to get out of an electric wheelchair. Her husband, who was a bishop in their denomination, they pastored at that church uh, for years and years and years. Everybody knew them. Everybody heard about them. She led worship every Sunday from a wheelchair and um, she, uh, she was just in this position. Well, they were having a, a series of meetings in Mobile, Alabama at the, the, the Bay of the Holy Spirit Revival with Pastor John Kilpatrick. And they brought in a young evangelist that nobody had ever heard of from England named Nathan Morris. And one night after the service had dismissed, see, some of y'all leave too early. You just don't catch the afterglow. Amen. See, there's some miracles that God's not going to do in 45 minutes. There's some miracles that are not going to happen in a cute one hour and 30 minute service. Sometimes you're going to have to press in and exercise faith. Amen. And so, listen, the service had been going three and a half hours. There was just a handful of people still there. Most of everybody had gone home. When all of a sudden, she leans over to her husband, and she says, I can feel my knees working. And he goes, what? She said, I can feel my knees working. Understand, she had been quite a paraplegic from the waist down, could not even move her lower limbs. And by the end of that service, she was walking around, and she was shouting under the presence of God. Listen, 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 listen. Three, about three weeks later, 
Three weeks later, she showed up in high heels and led worship on the platform. That didn't happen in Africa. That didn't happen in some foreign place. That happened in America. Friends, I believe in miracles. You cannot talk me out of what I have seen. I have seen blind eyes open. I have seen the de deaf ears open. I have seen God miraculously open the wombs of people who could not have children. You have come too late this morning to tell me that he's not able. The issue that we face are two words that have great weight. Are you ready for them? Faith and unbelief. Are you ready? Say it with me. Faith and unbelief. If you have black and you have white, they are the opposites of each other. In the same realm, faith and unbelief are the same way. They are the polar opposites. And what we see in the Scripture is Jesus responding to faith. This morning, we're going to see that. And I believe that by the time service is over this morning, that faith is going to spark in somebody's heart, and you're going to leave here differently than how you came. Amen. Can anybody agree with me this morning? I believe it's vitally, vitally important. I want to go back to Mark 10. Let's go ahead and jump into this and see what God has to say to us. Amen. The Bible says, Now they came to Jericho. And then he went out of Jericho with his disciples. Stop right there. That's confusing to some people. But you got to realize in Jesus' day, there was the old city of Jericho. And just a little bit, a few miles down the road, there was the new city of Jericho. The old Jericho had been destroyed. They had in, uh, erected something new. And so they came to Jericho and passed out of the old Jericho. Uh, so it says, with his disciples and a great multitude. And blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then they warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And so they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, for he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he arose and he came to Jesus. And so Jesus answered and said to him, him, what do you want me to do for you? And then the blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I might receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus on the road. This morning, Mark chapter 10 sets a a stage for us of, of Jesus' ministry. Now, if you take a timeline and you look at Jesus' ministry, this is not the last miracle Jesus did, but uh, it is one of the next to last. The last miracle Jesus did was attaching the ear of Malchus uh, after Peter had presumptuously tried to chop his head off. Um, but this is the last recorded miracle in the gospel of, of uh, Mark before Jesus gets into the triumphal entry on his way to the cross. Jesus is walking with purpose, getting ready to do the ultimate miracle, which is the transference of sin upon a guilty humanity, how he would take what belonged to us, take it upon himself, take what was on himself, which was righteousness, and put it upon us. There was a transfer that was about to happen. But at, somehow on the way from point A to point B, which by the way, we see this over and over again in Scripture. We see it with the woman with the issue of blood as Jesus was on the way to Jairus' house. We see it over and over again that some of the greatest miracles that happen in the Bible happen as a result of a divine interruption. And so we're going to look at this, but what we see here is a man who was blind. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I cannot imagine not being able to see. Likewise, I could not imagine not being able to hear. But they say that when a person loses all of their sight, right? I'm not talking about little cataracts, little blurry vision. I mean blackness. When a person loses all of their sight, what they say is, is that it awakens to great intensity the other four senses. And so your hearing becomes more perceptive. Your touch becomes more perceptive. Your smell becomes more perceptive because you have to rely on those things more. And 
so your body, by God's design of, of helping our body safeguard itself, uh, it, it tries to compensate for that which we're lacking. And so now we've got this man who is on the side of the road. That's interesting. Uh, Matthew chapter 20 gives us a parallel to this story. And Matthew uh, chapter 20 actually tells us there were two blind men. And for whatever reason, Mark's eyewitness account only highlights one. I believe I know the reason for that this morning. But I'm not going to go into that right now. But what we see is that this man is beside the road begging for alms. Now, can you imagine being in a place where you have to rely upon everybody else for your living? Now, I know all of us have driven in large cities, large metropolitan areas, and, and we've seen people holding signs and whatnot and all those things. And I know oftentimes we question, are they legitimate? Are they illegitimate? Let me just give you a word from the Lord. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Amen. You got to be led by the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you that in Jesus' day and in the Old Testament, they didn't have welfare. There was no social security. There was no Medicare. There was no plan A, plan B. There was no back way for you to support yourself. So a person's family had to rely upon them. And, and if their family was poor, then you, the, the law, which before the cross, technically they were all still under Mosaic law until the resurrection. But during that time, what they had to do and what they were able to do was sit and beg. They were to beg for alms and beg for change. And so they were just waiting on the grace and the mercy of other people to come and fill their cup. Now, I want you to imagine day in and day out, morning after morning, waking up in a hopeless situation. Nothing is changing. Doctors can't do anything. You know, you think, you think health care is iffy today. It really was iffy back then. They didn't have a whole lot. And, and when a person was blind, they just had to be led around for the rest of their life. They were a, a nuisance in many ways to portions of society. They got in the way, and they were uh, risked at being trampled over in the middle of the market. And so I want you to imagine waking up every morning of your life feeling like you're in the way. You're a nuisance. Uh, you can't see. You have to trust what everybody's telling you. And then all of a sudden— one morning is a little different than the previous morning. That this morning, you walk out to your post, and all of a sudden, way in the distance, you hear a rumble of the crowd. And there's something on the inside of you that at that moment you realize this day is not like any other day. Today I can hear, I can perceive that this, there's a procession coming through town and this is nobody but Jesus himself. I want you to think about it. The fact that he perceived that, G, the Bible said he perceived that it was Jesus of Nazareth that was passing by. Now, they were living in a day where there was no Instagram, no TikTok, no Facebook, no Twitter. Amen. They had no social media. They had no fax machine. They had no cell phone to text. Everything was by word of mouth. Now, I want you to imagine this. The Bible says about Jesus that the fame of him spread throughout all of Judea and Galilee and Jerusalem. The miracles that he had did. Now, I told you that up until this point, this was one of the last recorded miracles Jesus did. What that means is that testimony had been circulating from, from, from year to year that Jesus was alive of the miracles that he did. So it's possible that Bartimaeus heard about the fact that Jesus walked on water. It's possible that, that Bartimaeus had heard that Jesus interrupted not just one, but two funerals, one of Lazarus and one of the widow's son, who uh, the, the woman at name, where Jesus reached out and touched the casket and he came back to life. It's possible that he had heard that a man who had 
uh, a with, withered hand. The Bible says it was a withered hand. Does anybody know what a withered hand is? I, I don't mean to, to cast light or anything, but if you've ever known anybody with a stroke, their hands draw up and everything draws up where it's unusable. And that would be a, a demonstration of what a withered hand looked like. Somebody who had had a stroke-like paralytic condition. It is possible that as Jesus healed that man with a withered hand, that testimony had circulated around where Bartimaeus heard that testimony. There were countless other lepers who, uh, not just one, but many came to Jesus who were healed. Leprosy was seen to be an incurable disease. Surely it would take a miracle for you to be healed of leprosy. Then there's the defiance of natural law. Jesus uh, thought it would be a good idea to borrow lunch from a little boy to feed a multitude. And the little boy, rather than arguing with Jesus and saying that I don't have enough, he just gave it to Jesus. And the Bible says he blessed it, he broke it, and he passed it out, and it multiplied. And Jesus fed a whole bunch of people with the fish and the loaves. All of these miracles, you have to understand, they would, have, they would have followed Jesus' ministry. And so now, Bartimaeus wakes up that morning, same way he had always woken, walked out to the same place he had always walked to, and now recognizes that this may be my moment. I want you to hear me. Today doesn't have to be like your yesterday. Just because you went to bed with it last night does not mean that you have to wake up with it tomorrow. One moment in the presence of Jesus can change literally everything in your life. But I want you to notice something. Verse 47 records this. It says, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, and he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The very first thing, the very first principle that I want to share with you this morning is this. Are you ready? Here we go. Here it goes. Faith seizes the moment. Faith seizes the moment. Blind Bartimaeus was determined not to miss his moment. He knew that Jesus was passing by. He knew that his answer was out in front of him. And he said, you know what? I am sick and I'm tired of being sick and tired. Nobody can help me. Nobody can do anything for me. We would say that he was at the bottom of the barrel. We would say that he was at the end of his rope. But the only problem is Jesus created the rope that he was at the end of. Hallelujah. And when you get to the end of yourself, you always find the master. And so blind Bartimaeus saw that G he heard that Jesus was coming, and it began to stimulate his faith. Surely he had heard the testimonies of the miracle-working power of Jesus that had swept the land. But even though he heard about it, it wasn't enough. Why? The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, now then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos recorded the inspirational words of the Holy Spirit, and here's what he said. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. What, what am I trying to say? Those testimonies of the things which Jesus did stimulated faith in his heart. Amen. Are you following me? They stimulated faith in his heart, but just hearing the word, just hearing that Jesus was coming didn't do it for him. He began to step out and act. Amen. Why is that important? Because faith seizes the moment. Everybody say that with me. Faith seizes the moment. He seized the opportunity. In other words, he was not about to let Jesus pass him by. Now, let me give you some New Testament reality. 
Jesus at that time was in the physical. He was walking with the disciples. Of course, we talked about it a little bit. He was crucified. He was caught back into heaven, and he sent the Holy Spirit, right? He sent the Holy Spirit down here to the earth. Whether you can feel God or not, here's what you need to know. He is all, all present, all knowing, all powerful. He can be everywhere at the same time, all the time. He can be right here in Woodward, and he can be in China at the same time, and it doesn't even mess him up because he's God, and he's big like that. Now, but the problem is when we talk about God's omnipresence, meaning he's everywhere at the same time, it is not. Everybody say it is not. I need you to hear this. It is not the same as his manifested presence. His manifested presence. Now, I know some of y'all float on clouds, and you're the second cousin of Jesus. But let me ask you a question. Let's be honest. How many of you don't feel the manifested presence of God every second of every day? I don't, you know. I mean, I don't necessarily fall under the power when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning. That doesn't mean God's not present. Amen? He's present. But there are times where his manifested presence shows up. In the Old Testament, when Solomon laid the sacrifice and dedicated the temple, the fire of God fell, and the, the Shekinah manifested glory of God filled the place where they weren't even able to stand up and minister. In Acts chapter 2, there was a physical manifestation of the presence of God that filled the place. The Scripture is, is uh, repeat time and time again of moments where the manifestation of the presence of God shows up. So what am I trying to say this morning? Blind Bartimaeus saw and heard, rather. He did see, but it was later. But he, initially, he heard that Jesus was coming. And when he, we heard that Jesus was coming, his faith was stimulated to action. Now, here's what I, what I need you to know. In our day, in our time, there are moments whenever we sense the presence of God— when he is in a service, when you can tell that his power is present, when you can tell that the Holy Spirit is in the room, when you can tell that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation and true praise and true glory is going on, and you can sense the presence of God, we would be foolish in that moment not to seize the moment. So many people sing past that moment. So many people preach past that moment. So many people run right past that moment. But when Jesus shows up manifested in his glory, that's the moment to seize the miracle. Are you with me this morning? Faith seizes the moment. Here's the second thing I want to share with you this morning. I want you to look at verse 48 with me. The Bible says, and then many warned him to be quiet, but they cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. The very second thing that I want to tell you this morning is this. Are you ready? You might want to write this down. Faith isn't always pretty. Faith isn't always pretty. You know, I, I don't know about you, where the where the little church that I grew up in wasn't, didn't have a lot of people, wasn't a lot of folks there. The presence of God was there, and it wasn't uncommon when we left church on Sunday morning to see mascara run down people's face. Come on, they came to church with their hair fixed, and they left with it messed up. Come on, people. People's, you know, clothes were all ruffled and wrinkled because they had been on the altar or they have been on the floor before God. Let me tell you, faith is not always pretty. And oftentimes, we want God to do a miracle the way we want God to do a miracle. What about, the, what about the leper in the Old Testament who came to the prophet and said, if you just wave your hand, then, then, then I could be clean. I want you to just, I want you to do this miracle just like I want you to do it. How many of us have ever said, God, we need a miracle, but we want you to do it this way? Oh, come on, somebody. 
We all have. God, I want you to save my marriage, but I want you to do it this way. God, I want you to bless my finances, but I want you to do it this way. Lord, I want you to heal this disease, but I want you to do it this way. But I want you to know that our ways are not always God's ways. And faith isn't always pretty. I'm thinking about that leper. He came to the Lord, in, or he came to the prophet in the Old Testament who was standing instead of the Lord, and he said, if you could just wave your hands, then I'll be clean. And the prophet said, no, you got to go dip in the muddy water seven times. And the guy got frustrated. He, what do you mean I got to do that? You mean I got to get my clothes dirty? I got to ruin my makeup? I got to miss my lunch? What, 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 what do you mean I got to do all that? And the prophet said, if I would have asked you to do something uh, uh, difficult, you would have been mad. The truth is, is that faith isn't always pretty. Friends, let me tell you something. Sometimes when we're pursuing God and we're going after a miracle, we've got to sometimes do things that look foolish in the eyes of people. Blind Bartimaeus was sitting there begging, and all of a sudden, you know, the little crowd and the processions coming by, and blind Bartimaeus says, well, I, 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 can't, I can't see, so I have to use another faculty of my member. I'm going to use my voice. And so he said, listen, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lift my voice and make sure that he hears me. And what does blind Bartimaeus do? He cries out, and he says, son of David, have mercy on me. And all the little entourage that was around him. They said, shh, 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 don't do that. Be quiet. It don't take all that. Shh. You know what the Bible says? All the more. He began to cry out, son of David, have mercy on me. See, if you're going after God, you got to get to a point where you don't really care what other people think. People say, well, you know, it don't take all that. For you, it might not. But desperate people do desperate things. And faith is not just information. Faith is not, not just revelation. Faith, according to the Bible, without works, according to James, is dead. So faith that is biblical faith is always accompanied by works. And so what happened is he heard and he responded the best way that he could. And he began to holler, Jesus, have mercy on me. And the people around him were so upset because of his demonstration of disparity. But I'm here to tell somebody this morning, I don't care if the person on your pew gets on your, gets on your nerves. I don't care if they tell you to stop shouting. I don't care if they tell you to sit down. I don't care if they move across the church. You do what you got to do to get a miracle from Jesus because it's your moment and you don't want to miss your moment. Faith isn't always pretty. I got news for you. Life isn't always pretty either. And desperate people have to do desperate things. Hallelujah. Sometimes your faith will have you driving across the state, across the country to a meeting somewhere because God told you to go and get hands laid on you. Sometimes God will have you doing crazy things, but faith isn't always pretty. Can I just give you a little bit of a sentiment this morning? Don't be upset if people don't understand your faith. Faith isn't always pretty. Here's another principle we see as we read this. Are you ready? Verse 49, what does it tell us? And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And then they called the blind man and they said to him, Be of good cheer, rise, for he is calling you. Here's the third thing. You ready for this? Faith gets God's attention. Faith gets God's attention. You, you need to understand this. God is not moved by pure need. God is moved by faith. Over and over again in Scripture, what we see is uh, Jesus, these, these people come, the woman with the issue of blood. I don't want to get too much into this because we may talk about this in a week or two. But when Jesus, uh, when Jesus healed her, uh, when she released her faith by grabbing onto the hem of his garment, Jesus said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. 
In the Gospel of Mark, when the five friends lowered their, their friend down through the roof because the crowd was so big for Jesus, uh, uh, you know, they couldn't get in to see him. The doors and the exits were blocked. When they broke down the roof, the Bible says when Jesus looked and saw their faith, faith is visible, my friend. Faith is visible. And Jesus sees genuine faith. In fact, we talk a lot about the coming of the Lord, but let me give you a scripture a lot of people don't talk about. The Bible says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? God's people, we are supposed to be faith people. But faith gets God's attention. There are people who've gone before us, like Smith Wigglesworth, who did crazy things for God. Crazy things, very demonstrative, things that some of us would never do. But you know what? He had a successful ministry. Why? Because even if he didn't do everything right, God still recognized his faith. Whoo, that said something right there. Faith gets God's attention. It may have seemed ridiculous to others, but the cry of faith from the lips of blind Bartimaeus literally caused Jesus to stop in his tracks. He stopped right where he was. And what did he say? Bring him to me. Bring him to me. And they said, rise, the master calls you. See, there is a cry of faith that will stop Jesus in his tracks. Jesus was not anticipating healing the woman with the issue of blood. He was on the way to Jairus' house because his daughter was sick and about to die and died on his way there. But there was a woman who had a need who reached out by faith and grabbed the hem of his garment and Jesus stopped where he was going and fixed his attention upon her. There was a leper who came to Jesus and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He said, I am willing. Be cleansed. Faith always gets God's attention. It cost him to stop walking and to fix his attention on the person. Listen, it might have interrupted Jesus, but it was a divine interruption. It was a divine interruption. Now, I got to be careful here because this is the part that always makes me shout a little bit. Mark chapter 10, I want you to look at verse 50 through 52 with me. The Bible says, you know, well, if you back it up just a little bit, it says, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Verse 50 says, and throwing aside his garment, he arose and he came to Jesus. And so Jesus answered and he said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, isn't that a crazy question to ask a blind man? And then the blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I might receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Here's a fourth little principle out of this passage that I'm going to share with you. Number four is that faith must be expressed. Faith must be expressed. Now, I hear you. You might be saying, Pastor, uh, wasn't it expressed when he, when he cried out? It was. It was. That, that was the beginnings of his faith. And, and that was the beginnings of him following uh, after Jesus to get his miracle. But it wasn't the end of his faith. I want to show you how faith was expressed in this passage that maybe perhaps you haven't seen before. So, first of all, Jesus says, arise and tells him to, to come. And he's coming towards Jesus. And there's a little passage of, of Scripture, just a few words in those verses that we miss. The Bible says that as he got up and he went to Jesus, he cast off his upper garment. The King James says his loose upper garment. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but it meant something to him. Because in that culture, blind people were given a garment that they wore that signified that they were blind. Have you ever saw a person riding a bicycle or running down the highway during the day or night and they have some type of reflective gear on? In that culture, that person would wear a garment signifying that they were blind so that while they were out and about in their day, they already had a hard enough time. It would signify to everybody else that, hey, I'm blind, don't trample on me. 
But I want you to notice something. You ready? Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. This man has not gotten his sight back yet. But he already took his garment off. Woo! Come on, somebody. He had not gotten his sight back yet, but he already took off his garment. Why? Because here was his faith. If he called me, I know he can do it. Whoo! Bless you, Jesus. He said, I know that if he called me, I know that he could do it. And friends, I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus is able to do it no matter what it might be. Faith got to be expressed. That's why when I always pray for somebody to be healed, I always ask them if it's a visible thing. Do something you couldn't do before. Faith has got to be expressed. Blind Bartimaeus took that coat off and he went right up to Jesus. And, and it's almost like it's a funny little thing going back and forth because Jesus would have known what that meant. But then Jesus still says, what do you want me to do for you? Can I give you a secret? Lean in for this one. There's not a question that God ever asks that he doesn't already know the answer to. You remember when Adam sinned in the garden? He fled from the presence of the Lord, and he's hiding himself. Before that, God was walking to and fro in the garden, speaking to him face to face, walking with him in the cool of the day. And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve eat. They transgress. He gets fig leaves. He covers himself. And all of a sudden, God speaks out like he always does. And what does he say? Adam, where are you? God knew where he was. God needed Adam to admit where he was. And let me tell you something, God knew what blind Bartimaeus needed. He's a blind man. He said that I might receive my sight. And the Lord told him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and follow Jesus on the road. See, faith has got to be expressed. And if I could conclude anything with you this morning is this, and I'm getting ready to close. This morning, here's what I would conclude with you. If you need a miracle from God, I don't know what it is. Number one, he's the only one that can do it. Number two, don't be afraid to get radical in your faith. Don't be afraid to get radical in your faith. Let me tell you something this morning. Sometimes you have to do crazy stuff. I'll give you a story. Let me give you a little story real quick. Smith Wigglesworth, mighty, mighty man of God. Books, tons of books written about Smith Wigglesworth and his faith and his life, the people, he prayed for the dead to be raised and people healed and crazy stuff. Multiple, multiple chapters of books written about Smith Wigglesworth. But Smith, Smith Wigglesworth's story didn't start with Smith. It started with a little old feeble wife of his named Polly. And Polly was a minister with the Salvation Army. I don't know if y'all know this, but the Salvation Army used to be about salvation. Like, I'm not talking about the doorbell ringing stuff. I mean, William Booth, the, the founder of the Salvation Army, they were, they were preachers. They were street preachers. And they would preach. And, and Smith's wife was a preacher with the Salvation Army, and she had gotten saved. And she had this husband whom to the world looked like he wasn't about to amount to much. He was a plumber by trade. He couldn't read, really couldn't write, didn't speak well. She would invite him to church, and he'd say, no, I'm not going. And she, she was a little sassy lady. Sometimes she'd lock him out of the house and stuff like that. But she recounts the story 
He had multiple pairs of shoes and boots that he would wear for work and different things. And while he was gone one day, God had given her a word that he was going to save her husband and that he was going to be called to the ministry. God given her a word. In the natural, it didn't look like it. In the natural, he was still the same old person. But you know what faith is? Faith sees it as God sees it, not as you see it in the natural. It's faith. Faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith, see, so she grabbed a hold of that word. Despite how he acted, despite how he treated her, all of those things, she would wait until he went to work. And she would put on his plumbing boots. Now, she had a little bitty old foot. He had a big old foot. So she, they swallowed her up. When he was gone to work, she would walk around the house in his boots. And I know you're looking at me. You say, that's crazy, Pastor. That's crazy stuff right there. That's why y'all don't have miracles, because you don't do nothing crazy. Um, she walked around those, in those boots, and she prayed while he was at work. She said, the man who wears these boots is going to preach the gospel one day. She said, the man who wears these boots is going to give his life to Jesus one day. The man who wears these boots are gonna serve Je- is going to serve Jesus one day. Then she started anointing his pillow at night. She would, she would put, anoint it with oil, and she would pray over it. And she would say, Lord, when he lays his head down at night, I want you to, to speak to him. I want you to save him. I want you to wake him up. Folks, this is crazy. It's crazy. But listen, faith really does have to be expressed. And there came a moment where a divine interruption happened in Smith Wigglesworth's life. And God saved him and imparted a radical faith into him. Hooked him up with a man by the name of of Carter who was an amazing man who who knew the gifts of the Holy Spirit and and they worked with each other. Then then Smith Wigglesworth was introduced to Lester Sumrall and, 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 and all of these great things that happened because of a divine interruption in your life, in somebody's life. Why am I saying that? Because I sense the Holy Spirit right now beckoning me to tell somebody in this room to, to keep on interceding for that person that you're believing for to be saved. Keep on interceding for that husband that doesn't look like he's going to serve God. Keep on interceding for that wife who doesn't look like she's going to stay in the marriage. You've got to be radical about your faith and do something. And that's what she did. And God intervened. Listen, the woman with the issue of blood had to do something radical. The lepers who were unclean had to do something radical. Blind Bartimaeus had to do something radical. I don't know what that radical is for you this morning, but I do know this, that Jesus is able. Jesus is able. I was listening to the story. You can close your Bible. You can stand with me this morning. I was listening to a a story of a minister this week tell a story about how their son, when he was born, the doctors told him that he would be full-blown on the autistic scale. He wouldn't be able to walk. He wouldn't be able to talk. He wouldn't know who his mom and dad were. And that, you know, they might as well prepare for that. And the doctor came in and said, you know, uh, Miss Joni, he said, uh, I want you to know something. There's no treatment, there's no cure, and there's no hope. And she said, hold on just a second. She said, I can get with the no treatment, no cure part, because that's the doctor's part. But I can't get with the no hope part, because that belongs to Jesus. That belongs to Jesus. See, some of you in this room this morning, you've, you've just latched on to the, what the doctor said. There's no hope. There's no cure. There's no treatment. But I want to encourage you today. What's the whole point of this message? To help you latch on to hope. We want to pray with you. 
We want to speak faith into you. We want to lay hands on you. We want to believe God with you. No matter what it is this morning, God bless you. No matter what it is.